Good to go. Good. Good evening. I'm going to call this work session to order. This is a work session of the Mayor and Council of the City of Bisbee, County of Cochise, State of Arizona. It's being held on Tuesday, September 20th, 2022 at 5.30 Council Chambers. Uh, roll call, please. Councilmember Juanetta Hill. Not here yet. Councilmember Joni Giacomino. Here. Councilmember Frank Davis is excused. Mayor Ken Budge. Here. Councilmember Leslie Johns. Here. Councilmember Mel Sweet. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Anna Klein. Here. City Staff Stephen Pockin, City Manager. Ashley Coronado, City Clerk. Uh, let's see. Jim Richardson, Fire Chief. Joe Estes, City Attorney. Thank you, everybody. Um, we don't do a lot of work sessions, but I felt with these two huge ordinances that it would be wise for us to sit down and discuss them. So that's why I called this. I'm going to try to push this along to spend no more than 45 minutes on each one. So if I start to push a little bit, don't uh, take me long. But uh, so. With that, uh, the first order of business will be discussion and possible direction to staff regarding amending of city code article 7.10, the light pollution and Bisbee zoning code article 3, 6, 7, and 9. This uh, better known as dark skies. This is a pretty comprehensive change in our light pollution code. And uh, City Manager Paul, would you like to introduce um, us? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm just going to make a brief introduction, and then I'm going to let our two experts uh, field any questions that you may have. Um, as you know, uh, there <clears throat> there is a dark sky ordinance on the city's books already. It was adopted uh, several years ago. Um, it, it, it is a good ordinance, but it still needs a little bit more work. Um, I just want to emphasize two things that everyone I talk to worries about that I've assured them uh, that we understand. The first thing that um, I tell people when they ask me about this ordinance is that we are not out to take your lights, okay? We just aren't, okay? The second thing that people worry about that, that we talk about a lot um, is who's the polluter and the number one polluter of the skies in the city of Bisbee is the city of Bisbee. Okay. <clears throat> Much of what we deal with when it comes to light pollution has to do with making the lights effective yet not wasted. And um, to this day, uh, and despite the assurances of certain public utilities that work in Arizona and provide street lights uh, that you all, quite frankly, um, do not do the job the way uh, the job needs to be done in order to be effective and not allow for light pollution, which light pollution is what you see when you stand out in your backyard. It's that simple, okay? Uh, now, I happen to live in the San Jose area, so. I see light pollution in Warren. I see light pollution in Napa. I see light pollution in Old Bisbee. I see light pollution in Ananea. Okay, it's there. Um, I see light pollution at the Border Patrol Station, especially the new Border Patrol Station. Uh, unfortunately, this ordinance does not cover state or local or state or federal institutions, although I wish it did. Um, so. Um, what these two gentlemen have done uh, have refined the ordinance a little bit in accordance with the International Dark Skies Association recommended ordinance. Um, we've been uh, actually working on this thing back and forth uh, between uh, Bruce and staff uh, almost, uh, virtually since I came back to work. Um, we also have involved the city attorney. In the process, we involved with the city's building inspector in the process, uh, and it has been through um, the review of the Planning and Zoning Commission and was, um, was <clears throat> recommended by them uh, unanimously uh, for your consideration. So 
Um, with that, I don't want to take up too much time with that. I would like to, uh, and I think most of you already know Bruce Surratt. Um, Bruce has been working on this for a lot longer than I've been around. And uh, I'm just going to let you all take over at this point. And you can make a brief presentation or let them ask you questions. Okay. I think you already know that there's several questions out there. Okay. For the record, I think most of you know me. Uh, my name is uh, Bruce Surrett. I'm with the uh, Bisbee Dark Skies Initiative. And um, we made a run at these uh, ordinances uh, back in 2019. And they passed the city council unanimously. But uh, the thing that they uh, had before the uh, previous um, city attorney had, uh, I guess, been looking out for, or thought he was looking out for the city, um, chopped them up so bad that um, they lost a lot of their effectiveness. And so we're bringing some uh, new ones before you, like uh, Steve said, has already been uh, run by the city attorney and the city building inspector and also the uh, Planning Commission two weeks ago uh, looked at these ordinances. We had a session pretty much like this where they could ask uh, technical questions and those kind of things. And uh, once they were satisfied with what we had to say, they passed these ordinances unanimously from the Planning Commission and recommended it to you. So now we're coming up to, um, I'm running from the assumption that everybody has had a chance to look at some of these things and review them. And so unless we have any further ado, we can go straight to questions that you may have about the process. Thank you, Bruce. Um, <clears throat> so let me just, just let me know. It's, <clears throat> I'm going to try to just go through the sections and see if anybody has questions. Just stop me. I may not see you. <laughs> just hey, here. Uh, you know. Grab my so I'll give you the. Uh, so I'll just start off. Um, the purpose is pretty uh, straightforward, it seems like. <clears throat> and we get to the definitions, and I'll be honest, for me, reading through the definitions, and my uh, father was a physics teacher, but <laughs> I have to admit, some of this is beyond me, and I don't know what how the general public is going to take the word. Nadi, or which I looked up and found out is a point of celestial sphere directly below an observer. This is on section D. Is there, that's a tough word to, to understand. To me. Not everybody knew that. <laughs> All of you guys have looked through these telescopes. I swear. I, has anybody else ever heard of that word? Yeah. You have? Good for you. Well, you're a science teacher. <laughs> Dang it. Anyway. I don't know if there's some word that, that would make more sense to the common person than that. Mm -hmm. um, basically, I think some of that stuff was changed to make it more specific, like if it did have to be enforced. Um, I was having a conversation with the city building inspector, and he said uh, he could easily run into the same thing like if we had a sound ordinance that limited decibels. And when he goes out there, like somebody's complaining about, oh, they make so much noise, if he's got a machine that can go out and uh, record decibel levels and takes the guy to court or something like that, his attorney's going to be saying, when's the last time you calibrated your machine and all these other things, all these other issues. And the ordinance on light trespassing, I should go to that first, has been on our city's books for years. That came way before I was here about light trespass and if somebody's having issues with that, they can um, file a complaint with the city building inspector and then he has to go out and do it. But he runs into the same problem of how much light is trespassing and all these other things. And so they just redid the definition so it was much easier to enforce. And I was curious about how much of a problem this was for the building inspector here. And um, he can hear tell you himself, but I ask him, how many times a year, since this has been on the books long before I came along, how many times a year does he, is he called upon to go out and enforce um, light trespass? And he said, realistically, like twice a year. That's what's going on now. This law's been but, on the books. But again, I'm, I'm addressing one word here, not the whole idea that how we're going to 
to enforce it. So can okay. you just address that one word? If everybody's comfortable with that oh. right word, I just bought it up. Because okay, uh, now might be a good time to introduce John Maritime, who is our technical <laughs> expert here, who's been working with the city attorney and Steve and the uh, building inspector on uh, working out most of these problems ahead of time. We'll, I'll turn the mission, I'll turn the session over to John. Thank you. Uh, John Mayor Time, Dark Side Consulting for the record. Um, I, I get it, Mr. Mayor, I absolutely do. It's, it's an unfamiliar word. Uh, where we have suggested these updates to the definitions, we're trying to bring them in line with definitions of organizations like the Eliminating Engineering Society, which is the country's professional society for people who do lighting. And they publish some definitions that they recommend. Um, to, to clear up the, the issue with Nader, uh, and I wish I brought my, my props with me, if you could imagine me dropping a plumb line, plumb points to Nader, points to the center of the earth. So the idea here is, I took your existing definition of fully shielded, which was a little bit loose, and I'm trying to be more specific as to what we mean for exactly the reasons that Bruce suggested, so that if there's ever any question about this, you would have enough specificity that somebody with a, a, a little bit of a technical background could understand uh, what the, the definition is. So my only suggestion would be under the definitions that we have a definition for that. So that sure, <clears throat> sure. So that would be one of the suggestions I would ask that this be updated so that people that read this and then say, well, what's an ADAR? And then in all these definitions, there will be a definition saying, straight down to the point of, you know, however we want it, however that should be put. To me, that would make me more comfortable knowing that the normal person reading this, like me, <laughs> would understand what it's, what, <clears throat> what that, I understand what the angle of the pros, we have a, there's a, there's an illustration, that looks good, but, that, but then we have to know that that's based going straight down. So, anyway. Sure, we, we would not be able to that. Okay. Uh, okay. No, go ahead. So um, I do have a question, and it has it comes under um, under permanent exemptions, where it's under G. It says seasonal declarations that exceed lumen cap, section 7.1012 shall be permitted. Blah, blah, blah. And illuminated display shall be extinguished between 1 a.m. and 1 hour before sunrise. So a lumen cap. So that's in section 710, right? Through 712. I'm just curious, what does a how much is like a string of Christmas lights? Is that going to exceed that lumen cap? Because, you know, we talked about having a Christmas tree on the traffic circle, and someone has suggested, why don't we do a flagpole that has strings of light instead of this huge, you know, gargantuan? Is that going to exceed that? Because then it kind of defeats the purpose to put a tree up. Right. That makes sense. No, uh, Councilmember Jack, you know, that's a good question. I'm glad you brought that up. That came up at the uh, planning commission last month, and we wanted to make clear that we're we're not the enemies of Christmas. We're <laughs> thinking about the in in the old part of town where just the strands of light that are, are across the, the streets uh, for ambience. Those individually, those lights to just give you a ballpark estimate, ten lumens or less. So to get up to the thousands of lumens that we have on an acre would be vastly more lights than you. Yeah. yeah, exactly, and and I think we you know we would all agree that that nobody really wants the, the very the really garish displays. Nobody's after that. So the short answer to your question is, I can't imagine a situation where you would even if you added up all of them that you would get close to the limit. Oh, thank you very much. For that sure. I'm just trying to stay by section right now. So oh, sorry. Definition. Sorry. It's okay. It, it kind of is part of the lumens. So if you look at, a, at the new K, which is the definition of lumen, it's in this. It says it's provided in section 71015. There is no section 71015. That's been deleted, I believe. You should fix that, yes. That's in the existing code, and we would just, we would strike that because we want to strike it. Okay, so yeah. if you would make, I'm making all these notes for her. Sturdy clerk, over there, so. <laughs> yeah, so a definite, so that's what I thought was, there is no section 715. All right, anything else on definitions? 
Moving on to 710.3, this is the, the, the new use of buildings and modifications. Um, anybody have any questions in this section? I do have one which is under D, okay? This is the mitigation of legal non-conforming non installations. Um, it gives a 10-year period, which seems reasonable and seems correct, but when I don't want to jump out of, out of but when we go to 7, 10, 18, it has a five-year um, on, on um, utilities. So why do we have a five-year on utilities and 10-year on everything else? Is utilities treated differently somehow? Yes, Mr. Mayor, the, the utilities are treated somewhat differently. Publicly owned lighting, and this is for the benefit of if this goes for the, the certification by the International Dark Sky Association. There's a window of five years in which all of the public lighting has to be brought into compliance with the code. The IDA's point of view is that the municipality should be the example. So the compromise here to deal with the property owners is to give them longer to comply. So uh, that 7.10.3b, the mitigation of legal non-conforming installations, so that's one of the line items that is required by IDA. I try to make that distinction with the italics versus the plain face throughout the document. So that one addresses directly one of the IDA requirements. And again, that part of the background of how we got to this version of the text was starting with all of the IDA requirements, writing them in, adapting your existing code to address them to make sure that if you pass this, that box will be checked for the IDA certification if you decide to go for it. Okay. I'll, I'll bring up my problems with the five-year when we get there, okay. but because it, it's all budgetary to me, yes. that's which one question I'll have for everybody when we get there. But I just wanted to, a definition of why one is 10 and one is 10. Sure, that's a good question. Anybody else? Okay. Um, Moving on, uh, under light trespass, this is the other, another one that is pretty, again, maybe it has to meet what you're saying the code is and for, for dark skies, but it says, it shall not be installed or operate on any property whose lamp or light source is directly visible from any other property. Well, I do live in Old Bisbee, I can guarantee you, people above me, on the side of me, and below me will be able to see my light no matter what they're doing. So I don't know how how we're going to deal with this section because everybody would be everybody would be here for a minute. Sure. But I live on Spring Canyon. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, yeah. I live in Spring Canyon, and my neighbor is like 15 feet right above me. Right. And uh, he has non-conforming lights, and uh, I sit out in my backyard, which is free of lights and everything, and enjoy the night sky and those kind of things. And if he turns on those lights. It blocks out everything because basically you have the fixture and the bulb extends way below the fixture. So anytime you turn them on, it goes out to the side. On the property line is his deck and it's four feet wide. And ideally what he wants to do is light up that four feet so he can walk out there and be safe and around. But he doesn't need that light shooting on all over. So um, this is part of a larger thing that I discussed with Joe Ward that... Uh, Quite often with these issues, it's more of a educational issue than an enforcement issue. And so I went and talked to him, and uh, we were talking about how, you know, um, a shielded light is where the outside of the fixture extends past the light bulb and basically focuses the light down instead of going out all over. And so um, I'm working with him now, and they're doing it uh, on a larger basis here. When I was talking with the building inspector, well, when he does get these calls on light trespass, since we've determined that quite often this is more of an educational issue than an enforcement issue, um, my organization volunteered to, if he gets a complaint, to go out and speak with these people and try and educate them on what's going on. And if they don't want to hear anything that we have to say, then I can turn it over to the building inspector. But we figured nine times out of ten, if this is presented correctly to them, um, they can solve the problem themselves just by changing the light fixture. Okay, yes. I just hate passing something that I know 
somebody's going to hold us to that there is no way you can come in compliance to, of not seeing your neighbor's life. Well, you're in old business. So. But, the, but there's an issue between seeing white yeah. and what what this says. And it says whose lamp or light source is directly visible. It's so the if the actual bulb, if the lamp, that lamp or that bulb or that light source is directly visible. Now, if it's shielded and you're still seeing light from it, that's not a violation. It's the source. Right. So it's it's... It's specifically limited to the lamp or light source being directly visible. So if you have a light and it's got shielding and you can't see the bulb, but you can still see the light coming from from the fixture, that's not a violation. That's not a trespass. Yeah, I, I just look at the this and you're telling me that if he meets this code with the little radar, okay. On that four foot, you will never see his bulb. Is that right? Okay. I, if it's done correctly, um, recently in some emails that went back and forth between the city people, uh, somebody took a light, a uh, picture of Bisbee at night, and we're wondering what are we going to do about all these lights? And the thing is, we almost have to do nothing about these lights. Bisbee is already ninety-five percent compliant. Um, I think I handed out my business card to various people before Bisbee Dark Skies. Our motto is, let's get what we have. 90% of these, 95% of these ordinances affect future commercial development. Yeah, uh, all I'm, I just worry about passing something that people are going to go to and say, you need to enforce, and then if it's, then you can't see the bowl, if, you, if there's shielding that will allow that to happen on Bisbee, well, it's basically just well, changing the light fixture. Yeah, well, I, I realize that we could fully shield it or whatever, but I just, as close as we are in the neighbors, that seems like, but I, I, it is, um, I, that's why I'm questioning it. My house is a prime example of that. My neighbor is right above me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, questions? Uh, can we ask, I mean, um, I'm not going to go into the technical, but I have a lot of questions about so, uh, can I start now? Or can well, I'm trying to kind of get through exactly. the Exactly, that's why I, I uh, because, uh, like you just said, and I want to, uh, this B is like 95% compliant. I would like to hear, and I wasn't here when this supposedly passed, and we've thought, I mean, mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, about this. I don't have an issue with this. But, this B is not such a big city. We don't have all these commercial uh, buildings, we don't have all these commercial properties, we don't have all these huge buildings. And now, I would like to hear, and I have not seen it in this presentation, maybe this will come later on, what are the be benefit versus the cost? Because the mayor just said, we will go into the cost later. So uh, we would like to hear this. Is, is it such a big problem that we are uh, gonna invest, who's gonna pay for this? This is what I would like to hear. If it's not a problem when you say 95% is in compliance, then uh, uh, why are we, are we, I mean, I, I don't want to uh, have Joe become like a dictatorship here. We we'll go and check everybody's life and your life is just, trans I don't know how effective this will be and if, it will be, if, if this is gonna be enforceable. So we have to be realistic, this be, all this be, you can hardly have any new building built in mm -hmm. because of the codes and the various uh, restrictions we have. So what are we doing this for? And how much is it going to cost us? Are you going to give us the money? Are we getting the money somewhere else? Or will the taxpayer have to shell this out this money? Um, I'd no. like clarity on this. Okay, on the specifics about lighting on individual homes, as the building inspector told me, anything that is installed now, and it was installed legally, is grandfathered in. Okay. Okay, so nobody has to run out and change their light bulbs okay. right away. I think in terms of the commercial operations around here, just like any time somebody buys a business or opens up a business here, uh, whether it's a restaurant or whatever, the building inspector has to come in and check for, you know, uh, proper lighting inside the building and things like that. And this would also make the lighting on the outside subject to this inspection also. And like I said before, this whole issue other, it wouldn't even be in the corrections here 
if we would have just gone with the previous destination. The light trespass issue um, ordinance has been on the books for years here in Bisbee. Anybody could have made a complaint to the building inspector and he would have to go out and check this out. And that's why I was curious how much, how often this actually happened. On my website for Bisbee Dark Skies, I have a frequently asked questions. And number four is somebody, my neighbor's light shines right into my yard. Can you help us with this? And uh, right there, I tell them, no, uh, this is already covered in the city codes of Bisbee. If you think it's um, enough of a problem at your house, you can file a complaint with the city building inspector, and then he will come out and check it out. We can't do that, but like I said, and so this has been on the books for years, and he said realistically, he this happens twice a year. Just in response to what our city manager had said earlier, we are the biggest, uh, the city of Bisbee is the biggest offender that has the issue. and and. And we would, I would like, and I think the rest of the citizens here would like to hear, uh, if we have to go back and change all the light bulbs, I'm assuming you're talking about the city lights, and is this, okay. Go ahead. Um, if we're done with the light trespass issue, unless anything yeah. else, um, originally when I talked about this, I said I didn't think this would uh, pass the city council mm -hmm. if it cost us any money at all. Okay. okay? It's, we don't have a lot of money running around to go out and solve these exactly. kind of problems. Yes. And so when I started discussing some of these city lights issues with um, uh, city manager, Falcon, that um, he had some excellent ideas how we can change these lights and save the city money at the same time. Yeah. Well, well. I'll turn I'm going to get into that. Okay, this is, I, just well, I just wanted to get through so oh, okay. so yeah. any of our questions we would have. Um, I mean, I'll be honest with you, just because we've only had two complaints up maybe a year now doesn't mean we won't have 25 next time if this is passed. So yeah. I, I don't necessarily, I don't want to pass something that causes more problems in an additional situation. So I, I understand maybe we, people haven't known that's there. And, and so I'm just going to state that and that will, I'm uh, asking a question, I'm just making a statement. I understand. And, and you won't, I, I don't need a response. I, we need I, to move forward. I understand. Okay. I wanted um, to okay. reiterate what Steve mentioned earlier. We don't want to take anybody's life away. Right. We, they just but however, you did say, well, efficient. if they're grandfathered in, they're grandfathered in. But they're only grandfathered in for 10 years. Everybody needs to realize all their life pictures will need to be changed within 10 years by this code. So, so yeah. just, just, for everybody to know that, that's not not a true statement where grandfathering usually means forever and, that, and it's not. We as the city would not would only be grandfathering for five years for our city lights. Okay. Mayor, yeah. just a, a brief comment. Um, no light bulb lasts 10 years. Right. So, Thanks, dear Ray. However, you're already able to buy light bulbs at BB or Ace Hardware that are miles ahead of the light bulb that you probably have in your light fixtures right now. Um, you know, you have to, you, what you have to pay attention to is you have to pay attention to what produces the light and at what temperature it produces it. And so, in most cases, uh, and you know, I know, I know all the LED people say our light bulbs last 10 years, they haven't proven that to me yet. Um, and I've been buying them for years. Um, but the, the right light bulb at uh, you know hardware store prices can mitigate most of those issues at the point at which the bulb fails. Except for the one where your neighbor's right above you, you can see the bulb. Uh, that's right. That's Even right. though you change the bulb, you'll still see it. Yeah, just because uh, just why on this. So basically, if, if just a light bulb, that would not be an issue. But what we're talking about the fixture and the way the, the design of the fixture, because apparently from what the gentleman had discussed, is the fixture that they, they have issue with. Mm -hmm. So when you're saying the light bulb, I, you're right, the light bulb can be changed. And yeah. probably be cheaper, and the new light bulb will last longer. I'm aware of this. But the fixture, where we're going to have the problem, where the uh, cost association is going to be. Am I correct in this? If that becomes necessary to do then, yes. yes. OK. But no, just for clarity. I just you know, sure. if, if you think about, uh, if you've ever had to replace the, the light fixture at your front door or your back door, it's not an overwhelming 
that's the big ones. I'm talking about the city. This is like, well, the well city. I mean, I was going to speak to that. But the mayor we, we'll, get we'll get there. We'll get there. Mayor wanted to move on. Yeah, so just don't let him. Don't let him adjourn without asking that question. Yeah, yeah. please not. But, uh, one other quick, uh, quick uh, thing for Ashley to take note of <laughs> is under seven ten nine, which is the outdoor recreation athletic on. F, it says, as specified in item five above, there is no item five. So that's an incorrect. That's another, just, we'll have to correct that. It should be E, not five. Okay? Just to get it all right. And I did, I did my due diligence. I went down with my little highlighter, as you can see. All right. Uh, any more on this one? Okay. Uh, <coughs> I don't have any problems with much, we, and now we just have the total maximum outdoor light output, which is 71012, the new 71012. Uh, we talk about per acre. It's going to be very, very hard and <laughs> busy to do. I don't know very many people even have to. Um, like I was talking about future development, this is so we don't end up with, of course, it'd have to pass you guys, just so we don't end up with like a uh, uh, lonely auto center at the parking lot at the bottom end of town where the lights are on all night shining on all the bright shiny new cars that you can live and buy. That is lights per acre, excuse me, lumens per acre. Lumen, yes. And we have very few issues uh, with that in Bisbee other than, as City Manager Hawkins said, like the uh, Border Patrol place and things like that. Then, but, but they don't fall under our regulations. All right, uh, questions? Just to this, cost versus benefit. So we have a new business that comes into town that will be, I'm a businessman, and okay. I think about it from that. A good business, good for the community, is going to provide jobs, and for his business, uh, his business it necessitates some kind of lighting that to maybe have it look good. Are we going to hear say, well, you cannot open this business, Unless you go and it, it, this is the this is the question I have the, the benefit versus you know the cost. So what do we do? We can say we can't open your business. Well, if I might make a quick yeah okay. If you're gonna design a whole new business like this to buy the lights that would work under our code would be no more expensive than buying the ones that No, 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 it's not about the cost there. What I'm just no. saying, it, I, his business, uh, there's certain uh, companies, they have a certain standard for their building. Uh, what it's like, I'm just using it as an example. They expect certain lighting, just to reflect their brand, to reflect their image. How are we going to deal with it? I'm not, yeah, I'm not talking about the cost, I'm, I'm talking about oh. if it's necessary that, that, that business has a certain style that may need more lighting. So, uh, where, where do we, yeah. where, 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 yes, I'm, I'm with you, Mel. Yes. Um, I've, over the last almost 40 years of my career, uh, not necessarily in Bisbee, uh, I've dealt with a lot of lighting, parking lots, retailers, shopping centers, all that stuff, okay? Um, if we have the code in place, they are 99.9% .9 of the time happy to work within our code. Uh, number one, uh, it's, it's easier for everybody. Uh, the easiest part of this is any new construction. Um, and, on, and, and also, they're going to find that over the long term, they're actually going to spend a lot less money lighting their facility than they would using uh, the stuff that we It's I, about, I agree. It's with all you about sense. it's all about color temperature and the type of fixture. And I don't disagree with you, but certain businesses, and I'm just just to to, yeah, to bring it up, they, they they require and, and you know you've been around and you know they require in their parking lot for safety reason. I mean this is this issues. I mean like I said, this be currently. You're right. We don't have the problem. And I know this. I mean it's, it's nice not. But but we really need to make sure if I'm voting on this. create problem for us in, in, in the future. Just cost versus benefit. We don't have such a big problem. I, I don't believe, you know, we're going to have a big, maybe a 
car, uh, car dealership. I mean, that's what I don't think it's happening. Uh, but we just have to, uh, you know, and you know, and I appreciate what the mayor tried to do at the beginning to clarify the the, the wording on this because some of it is like you know an acre, half an acre can be. It's clear. But uh, we just we, we just need to make sure. Uh, are we bringing this to Bisbee? Are we doing it? Uh, we're not such a big city. It's not such a big problem. I know you're trying to prevent it from the future, but we have to look at this and make sure we're doing it, making the right decision. I might. I, there would be one advantage that if we can meet this code and get certification, that actually a lot of businesses that's like that. That's a dark that. sky destination. Yeah. Astro tourism is getting really big. So that's so when you states. talk about cost versus effect. If Starbucks has a normal sign and they wouldn't meet this code, they'd probably more likely, we, w we wouldn't be the first city they would have to do that in. So uh, uh, to me, that that would be the cost versus effect. Cities would, over, yeah. all over Arizona have already done this. Flagstaff was the first, Sedona, right. Val, uh, Verde Valley. Fort so, what, uh, excuse me, Huachuca City is dark skies complaint. It's dark. Yeah, yeah it is. Uh, they got a bunch of federal money because they're under the final approach to the airport over there at Sierra Vista. Okay, uh, really, we're running down, and I'm going to get to the one big question here. <laughs> um, unless somebody has uh, seasonal director decorations, I know you asked a question on that. Um, they seem like they're permitted once they're st extinguished, you know, uh, at 1 a.m. or, or to one hour before sunrise. That seems like. But that's only if it's god awful, right? That's what? It's only if it's god awful. Well, right? seasonal directorations should not exceed yeah. the, the looms. Right. If they did, they, they shall be extinguished. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Some of them are So. We went through this okay. planning but, permission. But there I'm going to have to move on. Okay. 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 I, I appreciate it. But and I'd like to spend more time, but we've got another one we've got to get to. So, and 7 o'clock comes fast. Uh, my last thing would be the violations of enforcement. This is the one on 7, 10, 18, which is non-compliant. Lighting shall be installed in good faith by electric utility, shall be brought in conformance with code within five years. Basically, this is this is the city, and I know we. I looked it up. We spend ninety thousand dollars a year on 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 our street lights. That's what we put out. Uh, we budget for every year. So what I want to know is, in five years, from our city manager, how the idea is that we will change out the four, five, how many hundred lights we have. Here. Six hundred and something. And, yeah. And 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 what. Does the cost savings of lower energy and longer out, less maintenance? How, did, how have you done it before? Um, well, good question. I've already done it before. Yeah, I know. Okay. Um, the current situation uh, in, in almost every APS served community, which includes us, is um, we give up control over the maintenance and repair of our streetlights by uh, having a streetlight uh, maintenance contract with ABS. We currently have one of those. Um, they charge us either $250 or $350 per light per month uh, for each one. And that uh, usually means that they're going to, unless there's some kind of incident that would create damage to a pole, like uh, a truck running into it or something like that, um, the uh, the maximum that they're going to do per year is 15 to 20 luminaires will run out. Okay. Um, what we did in a, another city where I worked is um, we examined the cost of that uh, and uh, had calculated the cost here, uh, but it's going to be similar because we have a similar number of street lights. Uh, we were paying APS. Um, approximately $20,000 a year to change a dozen or maybe two dozen of the outside uh, light bulbs. And so um, the council decided to um, uh, terminate that contract. Um, it's not totally without risk, but we terminated the contract. Um, we um, purchased a vehicle that can get up to the streetlights, which we don't have to do here, we already have one of those. 
and um, teach somebody how to replace the lights with night sky friendly lights. Uh, there, there were two options. We could either go through and change all 600 lights at once at a fairly significant cost, or we could just replace them as they burnt out uh, and or hit areas where you had a high traffic or high visibility. So um, in, in Winslow, high visibility is over Route 66, okay, from one end of town to the other. We went ahead and replaced all of those um, with a filtered LED light with a color temperature of about 2200, 2300 K. That is totally night sky compliant in a, in a shoebox fixture. So if you had a cold shield, you had the right color temperature, and you had a long lasting uh, low consumption uh, luminaire. So that solved all of those problems. And then as lights would burn out around town, uh, what we would do is we would just Take the high-pressure sodium vapor lamp right off the pole. Okay, you leave the mask on right where it is. All you got to do is unscrew it, slide it out, screw one in, uh, or slip one in, screw it back up. Uh, the biggest problem we encountered with ABS on that was uh, they're supposed to have a disconnect between the luminaire and the wire, right? I mean, that makes so much sense that that would happen. Um, so there were times when we would have to wait for them to come out and install a disconnect so that we could effectively do that. Uh, the, the turnaround time on luminaires is roughly, uh, to change luminaires is about 15 minutes. We're not talking about a big project here. So um, you could do that, you could do all of them once, or you could do them as they burn out, or hit the high traffic areas, or you could do something in between. Um, the, uh, at the same time, uh, say we did, so we did Route 66, so we go back to uh, the power company after Route 66 is relit, and we say, okay, here's the new lights come out, and we calculate, because they're not metered, as you know, uh, we pay a fee uh, that they fix on it. Uh, the savings is roughly 70% of the old high-pressure sodium vapor lamps. So, um, you know, now, w w did we terminate that contract without an argument? Of course not. It's money, okay? We're talking money here. But the $20,000 that I wasn't spending on ABS, I could buy a truck with, get the truck ready to fix it, and use existing employees to actually affect the work. Now, we don't own every street light, okay? Um, some of them are owned by the power company, so that would be up to them to determine, but it's a handful. What so much you buy here if you ever bought that thing. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, as you know, the, the, the street lights uh, that go partway around the pit on uh, Highway 80, uh, there's still some question in my mind, and I, and I know there isn't many of your minds, uh, just who has the responsibility for those, but they are hurt. Well. So um, it, is, it is doable, and the benefits, of course, are cost. You're going to reduce your power consumption about 70%. Uh, you're going to put the right color temperature light out there, um, which someone with a lot more uh, scientific knowledge than I than I have can tell you all about the benefits of better better sleep, uh, how it affects wildlife, and, and we all know we have wildlife. Um, you know, we got those high pressure sodium lights in Warren, so we got um, all kinds of javelina out there. I just keeps them away. So there you go. Um, now, it won't completely solve that problem, but it might make a difference. So, there are uh, health benefits to it as well. And uh, so, yes, there is, there are, you know, tangible benefits and costs, but there are also intangible benefits um, in general health and welfare of the populace and the animal life. Well, what I'm hearing in, the, in this five-year period that we should be changing all these, we won't, because we'll be spending money on new lives, it won't be a saving, but after five years, then mm -hmm. our energy cost should go down considerably. Uh, what I would recommend, Mayor, if, if, if you would choose to go that route, um, I would recommend um, uh, terminating the contract with APS at some not too distant future point. Uh, start taking it on as we see fit with money that we have that we can afford to use. Um, I also know that uh, there is money out there that's competitive, of course. Uh, that we can attempt to get uh, that would maybe perhaps be enough to relight the entire city. 
But in the end, our energy cost of 90000 would go down. Yeah, I would say you're, you, okay, uh, you know, all things considered, because you will have maintenance costs, uh, you know, you, you will have, uh, you know, hopefully if somebody knocks over a telephone pole, their insurance will take care of it. Yeah. But not always. It seems like the ones without but insurance are always rare. Uh, but it's a rare occurrence. And so uh, your $70,000, or excuse me, your $90,000 current bill probably could end up somewhere in the vicinity of $40,000 more or less. The initial, I have a question on this. So the initial cost uh, with the current poles we have now, the only thing we need to do will be just to change the light bulb. There's no other adjustment that has to be made. No, the luminaire. The luminaire. Yeah, so there'll be costs associated with right. this. Right. Yeah, this yeah. is what I, yeah. The ones yeah. that I'm familiar with, Mel, yeah. cost-wise, we we're running at that time $400 to $450 a unit. And if we do it as we go, like as the lights goes up, if then it's that we can spread the cost over. Mm -hmm. uh, Okay. Yeah, I mean, and if you want to make a, you know, if you want to do a five-year deadline, we can we can always time it over five years. So we're still Spre not spread it, it over five years. We're still not doing it all at once, but we're doing it mm -hmm. um, methodically, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, to get to your end, end point. If that's what you want to do. Yeah. All right. Um, we're the only last little thing I would want to note on this under this violation. 7, 10, 18 would be <clears throat> that there is a fine subject, not less than 100 and not more than 1,000. I'm not sure how we define, would it be in our our fee schedule? What Who gets a $100 fine? Who gets a $1,000 fine? How, it, this seems very ambiguous as far as amount. It should be for one violation to help me out there. Mr. Yeah, you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do it set that up in the, in the fee schedule to stay. Okay. A hundred dollar fine for the first offense. Yeah. So under C, it, it would be a, a, a step, typically like what we see with other ordinances. Okay. Like that's just your your initial violation is lower, but repeat violations, and you can also have it a repeat violation within a specific time frame because if if somebody's you know doing a violation once every three or four years, is it right to have it accumulated or if somebody's doing the same violation every few months kind of thing. So typically we, we have look at either, you know, a, a violation, uh, a first offense and a second offense violation within 12 to 24 months would be this. A third violation within 12 to 24 months would be this. Well, I, I will ask that that comes under C right here, <clears throat> where shall supersede uh, the city council to adopt the new fee schedule. So, if we're going to adopt this, we should also adopt part of the fee schedule that goes with. Okay, that's just, just one more question. Okay. So, the, you know, the people of this can get this. So, if you currently, if you have your lights, it's grandfathered in. Okay, how do how do we ensure? I mean, how do we know what's grandfather, what's not? Where you know, once we start, is is our Employees gonna go out and check every. I mean, it just have to do some clarity in this. I just because I know tomorrow morning, you know, I have a business. Everybody's gonna come and be asking me those questions, and that's the reason I ask those questions. Okay. I ask the hard questions because I want some answers. Because everybody does not understand it. As, as sometimes because we have it in front of us, we read in it, we know what's going on. But what the people are hearing, it may sound differently. So when we say grandfather and. I mean, when does it start? When does it end? I can perpetually grandfather myself in for, forever. I mean. Well, I'm, under just this, yeah. Huh? Just don't move. In the <laughs> under this, under this. Yeah, no, because he said after ten years, uh, the mayor did mention it. After ten years, everybody will have to switch. Well, I just be clear, I and mean, I think this is what's important. We have to be upfront with this. Okay, my efforts with this to be dark skies don't doesn't end if we pass these ordinances. Basically, the rest of my effort is through public outreach. And we plan on having a booth at the farmer's market with visual, um, some excellent things where the, um, um, they have an excellent photograph of somebody's porch light. Or somebody standing outside their door and the light's just glaring as you're walking up like you're trying to see who it is. And then they have one that's focused right next to the guy. And... It lights up everything on his porch that he wants without broadcasting that light all over the neighborhood. 
And I know you came over and you showed me, and I appreciate that. I'm with you on this. My second question is safety factor, because lights, you know, associate with safety. When you have lights, you know what's going on. Has this been a problem in the past in the cities? Have, has it? Has there been complaints when you don't have enough lights? You, you create some safety, some, uh, the, some uh, safety. For, for about two weeks after you change light fixtures, people will notice that it's a little bit different color than they're used to. Uh -huh. Because high pressure sodium has a distinct color. Mm -hmm. And they've known that for a generation. And so whatever you change it with is going to change that color. Mm -hmm. And so you'll get phone calls because people think something's wrong. Uh, or it doesn't look the same as it always did. Yeah. And uh, and then you'll explain it to them. They'll say, well, I liked it the old way, uh, but we can't repeat the old way. And uh, uh, and then it dies down after a few weeks. Thank you. And one final thought, Mayor. Yeah. Think glow, not glare. <laughs> okay, any other follow-up? Because I'm going to move along here. To, and I appreciate your time and... and I would ask that with these few changes that we can bring this back for yeah. full consideration before Mayor Council, unless anybody has a question. No, I just want to make one comment, and it kind of goes off of what he says. When you change out and you go into a dark sky, it takes away that nasty glare. It's not blinding. It softens it to where you even approaching your own home can help difference. You can still see because it's lit, but you're not getting blinded by the light. Um, so there are a lot of benefits. Personally, in, in a 10-year span, most people are upgrading anyway. Most, not all. But, you know, most people are going to do upgrades to their home, so maybe it's going to encourage them to think, you know, outside the box, okay, now that I'm upgrading, let's look at these mm -hmm. these things that are going to save me money. Most of uh, the complaints that are people that are worried about changing their lights is the stairs. And just being able to go up and down stairs at night and have an adequate amount of lighting to do that. Mm -hmm. And it's just a matter of changing the light around. These ordinances are already, I should say, in effect. The hospital just built a huge addition. All the architects know this is the future of lighting. But without having these ordinances on the books, the new hospital addition is entirely dark skies compliant. You can go by there, look at their street lights on their parking mm -hmm. lot, yeah. look how they lit their um, walkways going into the buildings. Same thing, like uh, the ball field. Um, there's a little field across from the high school down there. That's already dark skies compliant. They have small lights that light up the field as opposed to the ones at the Warren Ballpark just go all over town and light like that. Well, thank you for that. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll okay, get I just want to say, even though I ask you hard questions, but thank you. I know you have a nice presentation, and the reason I ask you, so we, we know what's going on. And you going out to the farmer's market and explain it, I think will be very helpful. That's where we're going to have things so people will know. If I want to fix my house, how do I do that? Okay. All right, we're moving on to item number two now. This will be discussion and possible direction of staff regarding the healing and replacing city code article 8.9, vacation rentals and short-term rentals. Uh, as you can see, this is an 11-page change to how we consider short-term rentals. Um, again, uh, I'll open this up for discussion among council and any uh, questions. I, I think they maybe about to get convoluted, just kind of move through really fast if we can, and then if you have a, an issue on one of the sections, uh, just let me know. Um, start basically with definitions I, does anybody have any, seems like definitions are all pretty straightforward. I don't see anything. Does anybody have a problem with the definitions? I just have one. On the definitions? Okay. Well, uh, maybe uh, it will come later. The definition, when we say short and vacation rentals, uh, is, uh, I don't, is there specificity on the number of days? Uh, because I can, I can say, well, I'm a short term, if, if someone comes in and wants to rent for a month, does that make it? A regular rental or short-term rental? Uh, we have to be clear on the number of days and, and the time. And that's the one thing I did not see when I read through it. Uh, so uh, we have to define that. I, I think we have to look at ARS 2042. Do you know what that one is, uh, Joe? Yeah. But, um, does it have a date? Or? I think it does. I, thought it was I did not. I read through it. I may have missed it. That's why I asked. Okay. 
Uh, we, we, need, we need to specify the number of days. Did what you, does constitute? Yes. Did, you, did you read the ARS? I, I went through it. I was trying to look for this, and I did not see it. So I, I maybe... Think, I think it also comes under when you're doing your TPT, because I know when we file our TPT on the long terminals... I went down, and I did not see it. It's, you know, residential versus commercial. So I think there is a, a designation for the TPT. So yeah, just uh, the speci specificity of the number of days, what constitute a short, because you have people that come here for a month doing on business uh, and they stay for 30 days. Will that go under this? Or I mean, just we really have to clarify the time. If it's, if it's here, that's fine. If it's not, then we need to make sure it's, it's specified. Okay, Joe, if you check on, see if the ARS Specifies. I think what we did under I did accessory dwelling units, we said 30 days. That's, what I, I, that's why I was trying to look for this. I didn't see it. But it's one thing. I mean, if, if you have the if you have the, the the house or the facility available for rent for a one or two day period of time, and somebody chooses to rent it for 30 days, it doesn't convert it from a short term rental to a long term rental. No, but if they come in and say, okay, and you know, I know because I get people that come here, they are on a business for 30 days, right. and they're in for 30 days. What would that be constituted? As a, it, a short or as, be, as a regular it would, it would be based off of what that house was classified as. Because if, that, if they normally rent it out for one or two days or a week at a time, that's a short-term rental. Just because somebody comes in and says, I want to take this... I want to take this room, even if it's at a hotel. I want to take this room for 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 a month or two months. It doesn't make that room no longer hotel. We just have to clarify that. I mean, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. what it is basically is if if you're advertising and making it available for anything less than thirty days, then then it becomes short term rental. If you only advertise it as thirty days, thirty days or more, then it's no longer a short term. Something that, like that's that. the that's the that's it. That's okay. it. If thirty days or more. What? That's the clarity. Well, but just because you rent one time for 30 days doesn't exempt you from this. Because you're still a short-term rental person. Okay, we just need to clarify, that's all. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> um, under the permit, uh, you know, this is requires a permit. Um, under that permit requirement, there's a physical address that must, uh, they must tell us where the physical address of the rental is. Um, they must name their name, the address, telephone number of the owner, and they also must give us a name, address, and telephone number of each designated owner, so if there's more than one, so that we now know who actually owns this and what the address of the place is and, and the address and telephone number of the people that own it. Um, and that's because a lot of times these are owned by corporations, corporations, LLCs, partnerships, People go into these as economic reasons as opposed to somebody who says, oh, I got a few extra rooms I want right now. And so part of the permit also requires the 24 hour telephone number for emergency point of contact because the corporation may have the own, uh, that part of it to somebody else, correct? That, you know, that is up keeping it and watching over it. So. And essentially, just like if you were at a, at a hotel, they're required to provide you with a, a, an emergency point of contact. Because what you have is you have individuals who are coming into town who are going to these houses and these residences that are using short-term rentals. They don't know the area. They don't know, you know, the, the local municipality. They don't know who to contact. If I got a plumbing leak in this house that I'm staying at for three days. They have to know those that information so that that it's available for them. Uh, to be able to protect the, the renters as well. Would this apply to someone, uh, like some people may do it, like for events, once or twice or three or four times a year, maybe for a major event, they have a little place, and they decide to do it for that event. What, what will that fall under? They are not doing it on a continuous basis. It's not, will this still be required to, or this is... Yeah, I mean, they're, they're still doing it for business purposes. It's just like if they did it just a couple of days a year, or three, four times a year for a yeah. major event. Just like those who you know, may have houses over by where the Cardinals play and they, they want to rent it out for the Super Bowl. Yeah. They, they're, they're doing it for a commercial purpose, so they would have to follow the, the registration requirements for that. 
the state requires. And, and you know that happens. Yeah. Like in the, for the World Cup now in Qatar, what's going to happen? A lot of people are going to make a ton of money. So they're just going to rent their house. Oh. I mean, that's their house. They're going to go and live with their uh, family members for three, four days yeah. where they can make a few thousand dollars. And they're just doing it for that. That's my question. No, so this would happens. still apply. Yeah. And, then okay. and we couldn't we couldn't exempt that because okay. then it would be a nightmare. That's control. why I wanted to make sure this yeah. is clarified. So, uh, besides the uh, point of emergency contact, we have a valid transaction pri privilege tax that they must have their TPT number um, and show that in their permit process. Also, they must have a valid city business I, license. I, may, I have. Can I stop you and ask you sure. one more question? Yep. The person that's doing it for those few days, he may not have gone and got a TP uh, tax uh, license. What do what, what, what you do with this case? statutory. Effort. I know, then we need to make sure, will that be enforceable? I just yes. want to clarify this. Because so he does it for this day, he has to go, <laughs> exactly, he has to go and get his license and apply for a license, for a business license, so he can do it for that few days. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just, I just that, want to clarify. That's a that's a state statute that's just we just put yeah. in or required to do. Um, Does that mean somebody's not going to do? Yeah, yeah, of course, of course, of course. I just want to make sure for if, those people if, who follow the rules. Yeah. Yes. When, even if you rent out your house for three days a year, you're required to have a TPT uh, license because you're required to pay taxes on that. Okay. So. And. Acknowledgement that the owner himself has not is not a registered sex offender or has been convicted of a felony act <clears throat> in resolving death. That's another one of the state uh, situations or deadly weapon. That's uh, there is also a compliance with notification for the neighbors that comes in later, but that's one of the things that he they have to uh, swear to. Uh, they have to show they have liability insurance and that. The vacation register, a rental is registered with Cochise County Assessor's Office in the correct way, which I went over there and got what it is. I've actually looked up several of our vacation rentals, found out several of them are on the half tax historic, which is absolutely not correct. That's for owner occupied. Only owner occupied, yeah. but the house was an owner occupied. They bought it and they never changed the, the so. It's time that some of these things, the other ones are, are, are but there's three different uh, um, numbers that you would fall under, which would be a 401, four, uh, 0402, or a 410. That's the, and it changes basically the secondary tax. It's still 10%, whether you're owner occupied or, or doing this, but it does change on the, they told me on the, uh, the secondary tax, the change. Um, so the questions I have about this particular set of, uh, would be one, how are we going to make sure that, that there's sewer and garbage bill? We wouldn't want to give a permit to somebody that owes us sewer and garbage bill. Would that be because of the, we don't give a lot, a business license to somebody that has one or is there a way we can? So it would still be the separate issues, whereas if, if they're not paying their sewer or water, we have the ability to go through and, and assess and, and lean the property and, and shut them off. But it wouldn't, we wouldn't, would we want this in that to say you know, we're not going to give you a permit unless you are paid up? With the money you owe us, so is that well, they should be. They should, yeah, should be because that's a can of worms if they don't right. pay the regular. They're not going to pay their. Exactly. I do have a question though on sewer. Well, oh. yeah, I mean, I mean, that's can that's we a good question. give that some thought and see if it's if it yeah, passes stage. Uh, mm -hmm. If we said current on all, so no outstanding utilities or fees to the city. Yeah. Okay, now you can ask. Me. <laughs> so my, I guess my question is, um, so we're talking short term rentals, which is a business. Is that sewer and sewer garbage now going to be charged like a business? Like no, because it's still a residential property. Okay, it would be the same thing. If I was renting out my property, I'm, I'm doing that as a, okay. I still have to do TPT and I'm still doing that as a, as a business. I could have owned 10 properties 
for long-term rentals and still do it as a business, but I'm, I'm being charged the residential use because that's what the usage is. The, the difference being that with a, with a commercial property, you've got people coming in all day long, you're generating different amounts and different types of, of garbage, and for example, a, a, a restaurant. You've got your, your kitchen is constantly running. You've got restrooms that are being used by hundreds, if not thousands, of individuals. You've got a substantially different. Whereas if you have a short term rental, does it matter that the same person who's flushing the toilet today is different from the person who's flushing it in two days? Or if that house was rented or lived in for right. a year, it it's still essentially going to be the same usage. No, I was asking so, yeah. because because of the differentiation. You know, when you're a long term, this is a residential. You know, now it's become you know commercial. Is it going to be charged like? But a it, it's still, still considered consider a residential okay. because okay. you're still governed by you know you can't just have a short term rental and say I'm going to throw thirty people into this two bedroom house. Yeah, that was my next question. It so. does happen though. <laughs> so that is my and it's a family reunion it's all the time. Yeah. So that is my next question is under the Airbnb laws now this is just Airbnb this is encompassing all short term rentals. They have a situation there where you cannot rent any more than sixteen individuals. Is was it ever considered the number of beds versus how many people could be in that house? Was that ever considered under I don't think the state I don't think the state address those issues because I mean you, I think yeah. there's still typically within city code you still have your your code requirements for for residential and stuff. I think we still have uh, and we should have limitations where even if it is a, a, a long term rental you can't have thirty people in a two bedroom house. Uh, right. Well. Okay. They can be be have a problem on the other side, but I know that's the, they put that limit of sixteen. <laughs> Which still seems like a lot, but there's a lot of big houses. And, you know, well, it just depends. You know, if you're talking about yeah. you know, the Paradise Valley yeah. is seven thousand square foot versus large houses, house, fifteen bedrooms, sixteen people is nothing. Yeah. You know, but if you're talking a, a minor shack that has two bedrooms, it's it's a different. Yeah. Some other. It's just cozier. Cozy. <laughs> yeah. <right. laughs> Um, As one who grew up in a family with eight children, I can tell you that ain't cozy by my name. <laughs> so this is the question that <clears throat> moves on to number C, which is the permit fee. We will have to put it into our fee schedule. So I have a big red mark there that says how much. How much are we going to charge for this permit? And I asked our city clerk and finance director to ask other cities, and so it's what I think we need to decide kind of tonight what we want to put in to the ordinance. Well, and you don't necessarily have to decide tonight yeah. what that is, because what, what you may want to do is you, you want that fee to cover your costs, right. your administrative costs. What is it going to cost for the city to administer this permit to go to do, you know, the, the, the city to enforce it, to enforce it. Mm -hmm. So those are the things. So you, you want it to be in proportionate to what your administrative costs are going to be. Because if you just say, okay, we're gonna have a permit fee of two thousand dollars, then you're gonna have somebody come back and, and file suit saying, you know, that's that's an unreasonable fee that's not based off of, of anything. You're just trying to prohibit this type of use. That's why I asked kind of ahead of time yeah. what opinions my first thing is I need to know from the staff what they think the cost would be to cover this. So I did send out an email to our listserv after talking with Terry, and it looks like the majority of the cities are charging the two hundred and fifty dollars annual or permit fee. Yeah. Okay, so that's so. What I will ask is for staff to sit down at staff meeting, see Terry back there, and look and see because there is a lot of requirements. This this is going to take a lot of staff time, but at least to get it up and running. But and then the renews renewals every year that will can cover our costs, but we want to keep it affordable. We, we're not in competition with Sedona or, or Paradise Valley. <laughs> so, so that's what I would like to consider so that when this comes for us in, in two weeks, we can say, because once this, once that happens, we've got two more weeks and it's 30 days, it comes into effect. We need a fee schedule in place at that point. Right. So, so that's, where I'm, that's where I'm coming from. Okay. 
You all agree? Okay. Um, the one thing that, that, that shows up next on D is, is this is puts the onus, onus, and this I think comes from the state law. The city shall issue the, or deny the permit within seven days. Yes, that is a state statute requirement. That's not something that we have any control over. Right. So I think what that brings me to <coughs> is I'm going to jump way far ahead. And if you go on to the next page under H, it says a vacation rental that fails to apply for a permit or license fee within 30 days of the permit application being made available by the city shall immediately cease operations. So what I'm afraid of is, is we have 150, I just, you know, maybe more, maybe less. All of a sudden, 30 days, we've got to be processing all these within 30 days, and if we don't do it within seven days, they're, they're out in compliance. So I'm wondering if, would it be wiser to maybe say 60 days so that, that we have a longer time period in order to, for people to set it up and make sure so, that everybody's on. I don't know. Can I be devil's advocate? Yeah. And now They'll all wait till the end of 60 days. Exactly. Yeah, I know. I and and that 90% of them will do that. It's, it's the way. Um, and, and that's the unfortunate fact. You give them 60, they're going to wait 60. Um, they're going to wait 55. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I don't want to pay 250 today if I can pay 250 right. and 60. Exactly. All right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I just. I just saw that seven days, and I know that's part of what came out of this. And it is, it's, it's going to be that initial wave of, okay. of hopefully, that initial wave. You know, we don't see initial wave, then we know that there's non-compliance, and then we've got to start the issue of notices and stuff like that for non-compliance. So, so after we send them, uh, just to clarify this, so once we identify these businesses, rentals, we send them... Uh, the question is, uh, they have the existing Airbnb or short-term rentals. We're going to ask them to apply, or we're going to send them notices because we have identified some of them. How, how are we going to start this? We're going to say, well, everybody that has this business needs to apply. Do we need to go to them? They come to us? Or um, where do we start? Maybe I can answer a little bit of that. I mean, we have a list now. Um, People take out business licenses. Um, we have, I think, a hundred. Last time I checked, a hundred and ten or something. I don't know. Oops. <clears throat> and so, yes, I mean, to the ones that we can notify, this is a new ordinance that's going to be coming in effect. We can set the date whenever we want as, okay. a, as mayor and council. And from this date, you have thirty days to apply. And and then after that, we just have to let people that aren't really going under the radar or doing what else. Um, all right, and then after those 30 days are up, then it's just a matter of when we got time, you bring up one of the sites, whether it be Airbnb or one of the others, and you do not see that permit number listed because part of the requirements is that this city permit number must be shown on every advertisement. Okay. So you bring up this advertisement for an Airbnb and it doesn't say this be permit 00573, then you know they're not in compliance and they're, and they're not compliant. And that would notify them. We just said, okay, and, you need you to apply, can, you need to get your uh, application. And, and, that, and that's the goal. Was the goal is just to, you know, initially make sure that people are aware and that they, they come in and they, they follow the process. You're going to get those people who just of course, refuse yeah. to follow the process and you're going to have to go through an enforcement uh, procedure with them. But, you know, those who are doing it, you know, you send, we find out, like the mayor said, super easy because if they're doing a short-term rental, they're going to have it advertised because otherwise they're not going to get people in the, That's true. to, to the short-term rental. So you check those advertisements, those main advertisement sites. If they're not in compliance, you just send them a notice. You need to become, you need to come in compliance within the X number of days. Here's the information. Uh, if they don't do it, then you take the, the additional enforcement steps. But, Usually, at that point, most people will come in and, and do it. Okay, they so they so want to make, make money. They yeah, do. of yeah. course. Yeah. Okay. So, all right, so I'm scratching my 60 day thing. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, I, I just have to Okay. Uh, emergency point of contact um, that, of course, would be something that 
I would, I'm asking mainly it's for our police if they show up, they have a problem. Somehow we'd have to have a database. I, I don't think it's a database that's out on the rule line web, but we would have to be able to, to somehow. Their emergency point of contact is required with their permit. Yeah, but we, so if it's 2 a.m. and the police officer needs to get a hold of somebody, they would have to have our database so that they could get that number. Right, we can, we can provide that to, to PD once, once we have that yeah. established. Okay, we, just that's what. Or you can also send it and ask for that information to be posted inside the residence. Um, it has to be posted yeah. inside. It has to be both, but the it, it is also part of it is that for emergency responses that when requested by a police officer. Okay. Um, yeah. That one's a 60 minute. The other requirement is 24 hours. The person has to be on the vacation rental premises or available by phone or text within 60 minutes. Not, so, and that, and that doesn't happen with the people. And that information is both part of the permit requirement, but it is also the the there is a posting requirement within the property itself, within a certain distance from the from the front door. Just like you'd see in every hotel room on the back of the door, it That's what it's gives you a whole list of what you never read. Oh. Questions? Keep stopping me if you get. Um, anyway, so. A uh, whole list of, of uh, prohibited uses, um, pretty standard, I think. Well, I have a question about that. Okay. When we're, it just says, on number eight, it just says obscenity. Um, is that one of those we know when we see it situations, or it just seems a little unclear? What's That's an obscene question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what's obscene? What, what are we talking about here? I will look into that and see if okay. we can better define a, a, obscenity because I, you're correct. Yeah. What yeah. may be obscene to me is yeah. not yeah. obscene to... To me. No, I was going to say... No, you can stop talking about now. Maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that one. Good. Good catch. Um, okay, moving on. Trying to get here by seven. <laughs> Eight, uh, nine, six is neighborhood notification requirements. Um, I had a little change there based on our uniqueness where this is what is allowed that you have to notify everybody that touches your property or somebody that's across the street. I added stairs because some of our streets are stairs. And... Uh, and that uh, you know, they, they have to be up, updated if uh, you change ownership or whatever. This is another something the state allows us to do. That. Allows us to do. It's not mandatory, but it, it's it's good practice because that way the neighbors know that this is a, a short term rental, and when they start seeing, I didn't see that person last week. I see someone different this week. See someone different next week. They know this is a short. And they'll have an I, an, a, a telephone number and somebody to contact. If there is well, one. they know that okay, this this is a short term rental. I know that they have to have a permit. If I have an issue, I go contact the city so I can get the contact information for the owner for the the record. Well, actually, in the letter that they're notifying, you have to they have to yeah they have to notify that too. So they want so you may have all and have that. So let me get uh, on this. So uh, whoever has this property has to go around the neighborhood and notify all the different neighbors. Yeah, Jason. Jason, not Jason. Okay. To your right. The owner, right. yeah, should provide uh, it to each like to each single family uh, residential adjacent, just so they, they just, the one just right next to them. Touch it. Yeah, yeah, touch it. The property is yeah. touching and you know diagonally across the street across or stairs. The across the street too. Across the street or stairs. Yeah. So if you've got a property. That sits here. I've got two houses next to me. I got to notify those, and then I've got two houses across from me. I've got to know. It's not a huge notification requirement. I don't even to pay you. We're not going to find more than five. Three hundred feet. Yeah. Just state yeah. or southeast risk. Yeah. Typically, you're looking at a notification of four four residences, unless you have, you know, properties. Behind you, as, as the max one, you're probably looking at a total. Of it doesn't have to be personally. You can just leave a note. I mean, no, so that, they will say I it provides a letter. Yeah. yeah, it provides the requirements of what has to be in that notification. Okay. So it's not just a. Oh, okay, not just. No, by the way, I've got a short-term rental next door. Mm -hmm. No, you have to provide the permit number, the address, the name, and 
mailing address of the contact point. So but the one thing I, the it. one thing I have a problem with when I saw that was they wouldn't have their permit number necessarily because they have to say that we have notified them all before they get their permit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um which came first the chicken or the yeah the application number. Yeah. change it to application number. yeah let's do it and the, and the other reason for that is this, say for example you've got a short-term rental next door to you and somebody is there having a rage and you know that, that's again i use paradise valley as an example because we represent paradise valley and they had substantial issues there where you have people who are going in and hey it only cost me you know thousand two thousand dollars to rent this mansion for a night that i can fit 500 people in and have a huge party uh, and especially during uh, this time of, you know the time of year where where you have spring training where you've got all these wealthy baseball players coming in a lot of them are super young and super single and they're renting out these short-term rentals and turning them into big party houses not something that we're going to have here but it provides that information notification for the neighbors in case there is an issue. Well, Scottsdale mayor told me his problem is is believe it or not bachelor parties and bachelor parties and weddings and a whole bunch of the other things. ones that yeah so that's in the address yeah that's they're, they're coming there for um, those reasons anyway uh, the posting inside within three feet of primary in, um, entrance that's just standard like you see in a motel. Um, insurance, the, I would imagine if you had a, a business, you would to insure it. Doesn't seem like that's so sure. a big Can't deal. So sure. <laughs> Not a big deal. Um, and then the, the, the background check requirement. So, no sex offenders have been permitted to rent or occupy a vacation rental. Owners are allowed, who allow sex offenders to get shall be found in violation. Um, so, there was a question brought up to me that the background check on each guest and when they only get one name, how are they going to know what, there could be five people there, they're not going to know all five names. So, well, that's part, part of the booking process is they're supposed to, just, just like when you, you book, you're supposed to get information on all the guests, the names of all the guests that are are going to be there. I thought they already say four guests. They don't usually provide names. One guy. Yeah. Yeah. I would think that's most of the most of the big online ones do because they do their own. They do their own background guests. checks. Yeah. And that's why it says by the owner or by the online lodging marketplace because it, it is a big issue in the industry. They they want to make sure that they're protecting the. Um, you know the, their clients that are renting these places out so they have an obligation to the the individuals that post and because they're paying them a fee mm -hmm. to use their marketplace to find these people to come in and to, to rent these places and that's part of the the cost of of that fee is that they're doing those background checks there's almost like a when you sign up for your flight you know you have to list each, yeah. each person that's how i had to do it when i was in australia so yeah so, but we are not going to get those. Those are going to be retained by the owner of the property. I mean, uh, yeah, we're not going to buy unless we decide. No, we're not some getting reason. those on a daily basis. No, okay. That's just something that comes up if there is an enforcement issue. Then okay, we, then we go. If police show up and they run background checks and find yeah. mm -hmm. this thing's got a problem, then mm -hmm. it would fall back on the owner. Uh, <clears throat> I get asked, and, and this is not necessary, and, and one reason I wanted the fire chief here was a safety inspection. I mean, I, I come from that background, so I always feel like there should be a smoke detector, a carbon monoxide detector, and a, and a, a fire extinguisher in any business, and this is a business. Um, I will ask the chief back there, can you do 150 of these in, a, in in 30 days? I mean, that's we have to have these done within seven days, or else we're in violation. So I know this could be a bit of a well. It's, it's prior to use. We can issue the permits. Can we? Okay, that's so what I mean. It's just prior to use. The owner shall obtain an initial safety inspection. So we we can still do the 
you know, they come in, they, they pull the permit, we verify everything, and then we say, okay, you're scheduled for your initial safety inspection on X date. They just cannot use it until that. So that, that initial inspection is a part of that seven day approval process. It's, uh, you know, and as we discussed, you know, one of the importances is because Old Bisbee, you have properties that are 100 years old that are not up to the same standards as you would have in, say, Scottsdale or even Queen Creek or other municipalities where you don't have those issues. So you want to make sure because if you got people who are staying in these these older houses, you know, do they have proper ingress, egress, you know, do the windows work, you know, those things that, you know, a lot of us take for granted um, that may not function in a, in a very old Right, and you get one on fire, and then it's right. usually two more next to it. <laughs> right. so, uh, you have to a, just a, a safety issue concern. Um, um, and I that that permit fee would also cover the cost of that right. initial inspection. So we would have uh, we have to go back on the existing properties that do have a business license. We still, we still have to go make sure to comply with everything else we just mentioned. Yes, just one yes because there's, yes. even even those that, that currently have a business license and operate as a short term mm -hmm. rental, there are new Today. guidelines and requirements under this code so we'll have to go back that and... would require additional information and things, so they would have to go back and, and, and bring their current operation up to the standards. And this is taken from you know what the state statute state. was passed that allowed municipalities to do you know, just in an effort to, to better regulate these circumstances where you do have a, a residential home that's being used on a, a more frequent basis as a, mm -hmm. a, a very short term rental. Yeah. So just on the whole commit amount issue, um, <clears throat> under our current codes for a uh, business license for vacation rental is $79.12 a year. If normally a fire original new business would be a $75 fee, so that needs to be factored in by staff in the overall amount we're going to charge for the permit because it would include that instead of a separate fee, so you don't have to pay twice. So figure in the 75 for the fire and then whatever else in order to maintain the, or to, to handle the, the paperwork and so on. So that's... Um, I'm done with all my little yellow marks. <laughs> How about anybody else? Do we are we comfortable bringing this back? And well, it looks like there's just a couple issues we got. We want to have them look at in the next two weeks. Yours, <laughs> which was a good catch, and and also some recommendations on the amounts for for the uh, and also my question about. So there's a few things that I got my notes and we should be able to have those addressed and back to the Okay, great. Um, I'm going to ask for a motion to um, in this uh, adjourn the work session. Yeah, I move to adjourn the work session. Second. A motion and a second to adjourn this work session. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. Uh, we're going to take a short break before we jump right into the major thing. So if anybody's on board, I understand we'll start a few minutes after.